Um, thank you so much, uh, everyone, for joining us today. Apologies for the delay. Um, here with us today, we will have Dr. Sumida Pakhail, who will be presenting on tailoring to uh, tobacco dependence management with people experiencing homelessness. So before I hand it off to her today, um, I will just go through some housekeeping slides. So if you're interested in receiving a letter of completion for this Teach Educational Rounds, please make sure you have registered for this webinar and completed the pre-learning assessment. And make sure you have signed in uh, to the webinar, webinar using your full first name and last name so we can track your participation. And please make sure to complete the evaluation and post-learning assessment that will be emailed to you by the end of tomorrow. And you have one week to complete that. Please note that a copy of the slides as well as the recording of uh, this will be uh, sent out to you this afternoon as well. So here's a little bit of information on our presenter. Dr. Smeener Pakhail has been a clinician scientist at the Ottawa Hospital and Ottawa Hospital Research Institute at the Uni University of Ottawa since 2008. She also leads community-based research projects at the Bridge Engagement Center in Ottawa. The Bridge conducts research projects in true partnership with people who have lived experience of poverty, homelessness, at risk for homelessness, and low-income racialized populations, including Indigenous peoples. The Bridge has designed and operationalized a patient engagement model, which has been acclaimed internationally. Dr. Pakhail completed her post-graduation training in internal medicine at Columbia University and later did fellowships at the University of Toronto and University of Manitoba. Most recently, she uh, completed a master's degree in epidemiology and biostatistics at McGill University in Montreal. And so here's a little bit of information on our disclosures. And Dr. Pakhail has uh, nothing to disclose. So uh, please also know that the content of Teach Educational Rounds are primarily based on the following uh, guidelines. Nonetheless, these materials, as well as the verbal presentation and any discussion only represent general principles and they do not remove the need for clinical assessment or treatment plans by healthcare professionals. And please feel free to uh, use the chat feature throughout the webinar to post any comments or answer any prompts. So to do this, you can click on the speech bubble icon in the control panel. And please make sure you select everyone so that all panelists, hosts, and attendees can read and respond to your comments. However, we'll take all content-related questions at the end of the presentation. So please keep note of anything that comes up and then you can post them in the chat during our Q&A uh, for a presenter to answer. With that, I'm just going to see if uh, Smita has now joined us. Right. So it doesn't look like she has. I'm just going to check back to see if she has connected with me again. Sorry, everyone. Give me a moment. So while you're doing that, what I'll do is, uh, you know, first of all, welcome everybody. We are, um, you know, I, I think I'm. I want to make sure that we use this time effectively and, you know, you've all joined up here. And so uh, please start with your questions and then we can see how we can get to them either during her talk or even after her talk and come back to you with that. Um, with respect, so why don't I, I'm not hearing, uh, uh, I'm not seeing any uh, uh, questions in the chat. So, but maybe people do have, so please start typing something and we can get the conversation going. Great, thank you, Dr. Selby. And just for those of you who are new here, um, I'm just going to put in this uh, link uh, where all our 
uh, rounds and webinars are archived and you can use them for self-study. Feel free to disseminate them to your colleagues who you might think might benefit. Um, and so, yeah, so Jamie has a great question about outreach and proven successful and engaging. Um, so that's a great question. We'll definitely ask her that. Uh, in the meanwhile, what I'll do is answer that question with what, you know, STOP has done. The STOP program essentially, you know, when we had um, working with public health units and realized that many communities were not able to uh, set up infrastructure for ongoing clinics, we, we developed with them something called STOP on the Road. Initially, our staff would go out and work with public health and have these one-time one workshops with uh, NRT access for five weeks or 10 weeks. And, uh, and then we would do the follow-up by phone and connect them to the various resources, like Smokers Helpline and others. Um, that model went on for a while and we published the evidence for that, um, that that is a way to do outreach into many communities. And, and the advantage of that is that in small towns, you get a lot of uh, 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 people coming off who are marginalized and don't have, you know, access. But the public health unit does, has is, has a way of bringing them in. So that's a good way to get outreach at that sort of population level kind of idea. We when there were um, uh, we had we've done a few in Arabic with Hamilton and other jurisdictions for refugees who came in. So that's another way of outreach. And then um, you know. Outreach in terms of uh, during the pandemic, we worked with some of the uh, uh, shelters where where people had to had to stay for, for, for COVID, and uh, providing an RT there was another way to to do outreach. Uh, so uh, having an RT available is one one element of that uh, outreach that that seems to help, uh, especially when people are in the places where they can't smoke. Um, and then Caroline talks about um, mental health and tobacco cessation departments are separate silos. Mental health thinks that they have no time for tobacco suggestions. How to deal with this? Uh, uh, yeah, that's a that's a big that's a big question. As they you know, mental health doesn't uh, you know, often has difficulty dealing with the other substance use, and it's coming closer. Um, but um, it's really when you know it takes a lot of engagement and education and looking at outcomes for mental health conditions when, when people are smoking, what it Im impacts on uh, the cause of mental illnesses. So there's more and more evidence of the association between smoking and onset of mental illness, worsening of mental illness, and that improvement of mental illness when people quit for like depression, anxiety, um, and then how to do it uh, is also critical. Uh, Elements and we have this whole course on mental health and addiction. So, yeah, it, it, I mean, it comes down to that engagement that we have to do um, uh, with them. Uh, so, that is a key issue. We we start off with those four things about engaging, find out what their issues are, um, and and how where does tobacco fit in. So often in inpatient places. It's not about smoking cessation as much as it's about managing acute nicotine withdrawal. And so we have to really work with them to, to think about how to manage nicotine withdrawal, and that's what we do. Um, you know, so that's that is in, is is one way uh we have been able to get them, and then we help them with setting up uh you know ways of um managing inpatient nicotine withdrawal, including advanced directives, medical directives and standing orders, etc. So that empowers nurses and others to be able to, to do that in those settings. Uh, then in the ambulatory setting, of course, you know, the we, we currently have obviously we have people who come in, about a third of people who come into our clinic have severe mental illness. And they want to quit. It's just that people haven't offered them that. Um, and one way we've been able to get psychiatrists to think about it is is because of the high mortality. Like 25 years ex excess mortality. So that has been in people with schizophrenia. So that has been one way. The other way is to tell them that look, the medications they give them are causing are causing you know them to gain weight and get diabetes. And smoking with combined with that is going to cause them more harm. So uh, you know we have a duty to you know to treat that as well because you need to treat their diabetes. You need to treat what you're causing from your medications 
interdict the smoking as well. So that's been fairly good with the psychiatrist. And then one of the things we have to do with our mental health staff is to make sure the staff are also supported in quitting. Uh, because it's very hard for staff to see that their patients are doing better than they are when the patient quits, but they're still smoking. So, so you have to have that sort of multi-level approach to helping them um, uh, engage. So, Caroline, hopefully that answers your your question. Um, now, before I keep you know <laughs> making this an ad hoc uh, rounds, I'm just checking to see if she's been able to respond back to me. Uh, in, is she in touch with you uh, or where she's at? Oh, she's yeah. saying none of the links are working from laptop or desktop. So, yeah, uh, I'm just, I'm not sure why exactly she's having trouble logging on. So, we're just trying to help her. Um, I maybe really, let her come on as an attendee and then. Um, yeah, I did okay. also send her an attendee a link and for some reason it's, it's still not working, but. Um, is she, can, can she call in by phone and. Uh, she should be able to, um. So, maybe send her the thing, just say to call in by phone. All right. Okay. All right. So, sorry about that. I'm not sure why she's having, uh, but. Um, yeah, so the regular follow up sessions, I mean, you know, that is a, that's a challenge for everything. And, um. In part, uh, we, you know, we are thinking about, I mean, that's why sometimes the, the one off, uh, you know, workshop might help, but again, they need a place to keep the NRT Even five weeks of NRT is 5 boxes. That's a lot. Um, and, and, and I think it's really, I think that's where the model that Dr. Um, was going to talk to us about is really critical because they create a connection with the person and the person keeps coming back. So. You just don't need to do that. Um, uh, so that that is something uh, you you know we need to think about. Um, and then I think the last question I can answer here is: Is there a rational jurisdictional examples where they've extended free NRT for beyond twenty four weeks per year? Yes. Roughly in Quebec, I think you can get nicotine uh, smoking cessation treatment as pretty much uninterrupted. Uh, We've been able to get up to 26 weeks. We're working on situations where we can get the nicotine at least longer, but we're not there yet. We'll see how that works out. Um, we are trying with, uh, uh, and obviously with the prescriptions that they're only giving it once per calendar year for, for 24 weeks. There's been a recent study that came out of um, out of. Wisconsin, a very well done study that shows that extending treatment in general populations doesn't seem to be any better than shorter treatment. So we are re looking at that evidence and saying maybe that's true, it may not work for everyone, but there may be a subset, uh, for example, people who have uh, you know, mental illness and other things. Uh, anyway, looks like we have Dr. Pakale in finally. Uh, so I was, I was, so the opening act can now exit left uh, and hand it off to Dr. Parkley. So. Yeah, so, thank you so much. Can, can uh, we hear her? Wondering. Can she hear us? Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. we can. Oh, sorry. I am on my desktop and I don't have a camera, but at least I am here. Yes. That's what's important. <laughs> All right. Um. Are you able to share your, your presentation? That's what I'm trying because it took a long time. I don't know why it was kept going round and round. Hmm. And um, well, we're happy you were able to make it. So, yeah, I'm trying to share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, perfect. Perfect. Finally. 
Uh, Smita, we're going to have to ask you, you know, because we only have now uh, uh, 25 minutes left to, to maybe yes, I know. speak to the highlights and the questions in the in the chat. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Are there are questions in the chat that I need to answer. Uh, I, I will. Yeah, you know what? We'll have to repost them actually. So, uh, um, maybe uh, if you can just copy and paste them back in. Uh, I, then Dr. Bakale, but why don't you go ahead and start presenting and then we've done your introduction. We've, we so welcome and thank you for making the time. Uh, but thank maybe you, you want to just jump much. ahead. And I'm so sorry for all the kerfuffle and, uh, all my fault. I take the blame, but I'm trying since half an hour and none of the links are working. Anyway, we are here. Thank you so very kindly and we wanted to. Uh, share our experience uh, in Ottawa at the Bridge Engagement Center. That's our community based research center where we are tackling this monster of tobacco um, since last few years. Um, so, without further ado, um, uh, you had done the bio. I had created just the slides the way you created Natalia. And I do not have any disclosures, but these are my affiliations and funding partners. So, just you know, the bias coming out of that, maybe, um, but. Uh, so, the learning objectives today is supposed to be the reviewing the prevalence and disease burden, tailoring the um, tobacco dependence management strategies to people who experience homelessness and uh, a lot of them are indigenous and uh, marginalized and describing what community partnership really mean to us in terms of tobacco dependence. So, we know, I mean, this is, uh, you know, I'm preaching the crowd here. We already know the monster is issue of tobacco and uh, it keeps growing and a lot of uh, millions of people losing their lives. And also we lose millions of dollars of money in terms of healthcare costs, uh, but also societal cost. So there is a lot of direct and indirect costs associated with tobacco. And this was a beautiful review recently published from, uh, some uh, authors uh, from uh, Aus um, New Zealand actually, and uh, had tried to summarize the cost of tobacco, but it is a very difficult task, and, but they have done quite a good job in that and with different countries. And you can see even in Canada, we spend billions of dollars, direct and indirect cost in addition to the lives lost. When it comes to the most marginalized population, we want to talk about health inequity because tobacco I see as a tobacco inequity issue. And that's what it is because it affects the most marginalized, those who are um, less educated, people who are indigenous, low income, racialized, LGBTQS, et cetera, et cetera. So it is an inequity issue and we need to uh, understand why. And the targeted advertising and product placement continues towards the marginalized population in the low income neighborhood, for example, there are more convenience stores. And that targeted marketing is savvy and getting more savvy with the gadgets, which looks like your iPhone and iPad and, um, and, uh, they become more, um, appealing to the younger generation because they need to create the replacement smokers. And that's the word I have not made up. And this is the word used by the tobacco industry because they want to create the replacement smokers because they know. The other people are going to die and die sooner. So they get more and more savvy and um, impressive ads, designer ads through all the social media. Um, uh, and they uh, get more impressive and don't we know more. So we have been here, we have done this and we have learned from past, but we still going forward. We are replacing one um, monster with another. And we do not learn from our past, knowing fully well how many diseases are caused by tobacco. And I will urge you to go to this 50th anniversary US Surgeon General's report where causally linked diseases with primary tobacco smoking and secondary tobacco smoking are listed there very vividly, uh, giving all the reference documents behind it. So, what can we do to protect the impoverished and marginalized population and community based? True partnership is the way to go. At least that's what we believe in and engaging people and working with them, creating low threshold safe spaces with a harm reduction kind of approach is very, very important because we need to prevent rather than treat because the treatment of 
very lethal diseases we don't even have. And reducing and quitting tobacco always helps. And these are old um, references from Dr. Antonison. And uh, we need to understand this is the mortality benefit you get by reducing and quitting tobacco. So the tobacco dependence is a chronic disease, and that's what we tried to highlight in this document we published a few years ago um, in the American um, Thoracic Society Journal. Because it is a lethal weapon, much more lethal than all the wars combined and all the drugs combined, uh, tobacco remains the highest killer uh, and it is a chronic disease, uh, and we need to look at it as a chronic disease. So we published the guidelines how to treat tobacco dependence last year, and I urge you to go to that document. It's a um, very well-researched evidence-based guidelines published in the Blue Journal last year, and these were the six PICOs we attacked in that. I will leave that up to you. That's not the topic for today, but I wanted to include so that you have the material online. What we, what we are doing here, um, protecting and partnering with the marginalized population is the today's uh, you know topic and i wanted to highlight the community based participatory action research project that we have uh, operationalized in ottawa this was the first project where we uh, enrolled 856 people and we saw that uh, along with other detailed socio demographics what we learn in this that tobacco is very much prevalent, much more than anywhere else. As you can see, rest of Canada in Ottawa lowest and the proportion of smoking coming down steadily. But when you come to this population, there is 96% smoking, which is like almost everybody smoking. And that's what leads to multiple ER visits, hospitalization, the diseases and premature deaths very vividly, as you know. So we learned a lot about the social determinants through our projects and how people are entangled into a lot of different mental health issues and physical issues and housing and food insecurity, a school dropout, getting into addiction trap and engaging into survival work and, and somehow surviving with the trauma from childhood, uh, sexual, physical abuse, emotional abuse. And uh, this is a common theme in many people's lives that we meet at the bridge. So this is very important, the complexities of the tobacco along with the social determinants of health is what we decided to take on in this project called PROM because people wanted us to do that after the PROUD project. When they learn 96% people smoke and in Ottawa 9 to 12%, they wanted to take us the tobacco head on. And that's what we did in this project. This was a community-based people driven in partnership with them prospective cohort study where we have um, participated in 80 participants from the homeless or insecurely housed population who currently use drugs, and we gave them nicotine replacement therapy, whatever they wanted, buffet approach, counseling by an expert nurse, and then also some weekly peer-led workshops, workshops on the uh, topics that they wanted, not created by us, but generated by people. And that's what we did, and we found in this model when we um, partnered with the people uh, with lived experience from beginning till the end, and this is where it published the, we call it Ottawa Citizen Engagement and Action Model, and you can read through that paper. These are the 10 steps we defined there, how we partnered with people right from the get-go, from formulating the question, the research question came from them, designing the research method, designing the tools, um, the questionnaires, um, and of course they recruited and they consented and they administered the survey, they followed them up, they brought them for the um, workshops. And with this end-to-end -end partnership led to very impressive results. And this kind of a true partnership, that's what we mean by citizen, peer, or patient engagement. The true partnership is what we needed, a need from beginning till the end. And this is where we publish our um, outcomes of the PROM project, where we demonstrated that not that people reduce their tobacco consumption right from the get-go, measured by exhaled carbon monoxide, not just self-report, and 
also they reduce all other drugs quite significantly so and we did not have any expertise or funding to help them on their drugs but they themselves took that step many of them said they feel better they eat better they breathe better um, they reunited with their family some found better job better uh, you know so these were like kind of a downstream uh, positive effects that we did not expect, but they themselves did not expect. They taught us a lot what they felt during the uh, process when they reduced and what were their uh, hindrances. And with that, we took that to the next level. All that learning and partnership, um, because there are a lot of mental health issues, as I was telling, the social determinants of health, as you can see here, about quarter of them, indigenous population, or 80% of them with food insecurity. And this is a capital city of a rich country. 80% people say they are food insecure. So these are the very um, devastating statistics that people live with day to day. And then on the top of that, all other co-addictions. So their quality of life was measured, that got better, um, disease-specific quality of life uh, as compared to other you know, populations, uh, what we saw they felt overall better. We also measured spirometry and people did spirometry themselves, like people uh, from the uh, community peer researchers. And we saw that about almost 60% of people have obstructive lung disease in our cohort. And that's a very devastating number. Obstructive lung disease is not that common in the rest of the population. And these are impacted by two major themes we saw in our data, socioeconomic status and stress and social networks uh, and related experiences of trauma. And this suggests a theological role of social determinants of health. That's what we said in this paper of ours. So it's very um, vivid correlation between the social determinants of health, co-addictions, mental health issues, and obstructive lung diseases like diseases. And this is the largest contribution. You know, the obstructive lung disease is the most contributing. I showed you the cost data. This is what drives cost, the COPD kind of diseases and other uh, respiratory diseases and cancers. They are the cost driving of tobacco related costs. So there are some, you know, in the common lay media, you can read these stories, actually the um, journalists write better story on us than us. So if you want to read more around our um, journey at the bridge, but where are we going next? So from whatever we learned from previous studies, we designed healthy people initiative. And this is again, co-designed with people on the ground, implementing what was learned before. And this is how empowering people to the next level. And we did a um, pilot project on that and we saw very impressive results. People were connected to the things that they wanted to be connected to, a hobby or skill or a job or uh, whatever that they said created by them and, and co-created together. So now we have a um, CIHR operating grant that we are going to uh, that we were unveiling here in, in Toronto and then the COVID happened. So we will be continuing that. We received some more funding from PHAC uh, to continue those randomized control trial in the community. So we are trying to um, create this Siamese conjoint twin with academic rigor of research, uh, with randomized control trial like design and in a community with a community partnership. So we are trying to bring the best of the both worlds. And of course, we have a lot of um, uh, um, problems and roadblocks and those words we are. So we are kind of creating a different kind of a language for research, a different inclusive language for research. And with that, we will create some new framework. We have a couple of PhD students working on that. And that's what we want to build uh, because that's what we mean really by patient engagement, this kind of a partnership with the community and for the community and by the community, creating co-creating solutions. Um, and that's what we live and breathe at the bridge, this community-based participatory action research. As we know, we have a lot of indigenous representation. So we have a lot of indigenous people in the community peer researchers. We cook and eat in turkey dinners and uh, 
a lot of um, storytelling and listening to stories and and this is how we by and by do the research on the side but we are cooking and eating and uh, that kind of atmosphere at the bridge which is kind of low threshold and um, safe uh, for people. We have a community advisory committee, which is represented by people from the community and indigenous people. Uh, they are the voting members and people representative from the neighborhood um, organizations. They are the non voting members and we meet either quarterly or as needed and. Vision and mission of the bridge. Uh, is overseen by this community advisory committee. We have community knowledge forums where people like Ted and Terry and our community peers present uh, their findings and their experiences. And that's how empowering people leads to positive uh, long term and short term outcome. That's what we have seen, how we have trained them. This was the other paper if you're interested in and how they did the spirometry now anybody of you know how the spirometry works it's very tedious but they took it on themselves and got the trading and um, created very good data that's what we published recently about the obstructive lung disease measured by the spirometry up to 60 percent of the people so thank you and i'm sorry for the delay but if there is any questions or comments please um Feel free to email me, reach out to me, um, and uh, we will continue our work. Yeah, thank you. It seems we have about five, ten minutes for questions if you wanted to uh, answer some that are in the chat already. I, I post, I reposted them for you, Smita. I don't know if you can reposted. see them, otherwise, we can read them out. Or, or even, I don't know if other, um, so for example, Caroline McIntosh said, how do you engage yeah. your internal partners to better serve at risk populations? Come again, your voice was. Uh... How, do, how, do you, how do you engage internal partners to better serve at risk populations? Internal partners, you mean at the hospital or the community partners? I'm not sure, Caroline, if you want to uh, type it in or. I don't know if, uh, Ali, can people unmute themselves or no? Uh, they cannot, but yeah, they can put it back in the, in the chat for us. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Within, Within the, the health, health, health center. center. So Smita, I don't know if you saw that Caroline said within the health center. Uh, oh, so within the health center. So yes, you know, a lot of people for a lot of time, Caroline, with the thought I, you know, I have some drop in center somewhere. They didn't even call what I do as a research for a long time. Then we got CIHR funding and then everybody was like, oh, what does Smita do there? Oh, we thought she just has some drop in center. So there are a lot of, you know, um, academic people think we are the best and we went to school. So we know the research best. One of my senior colleague, actually, to tell you the truth, um, said this to me, and this is not too long ago, that Smita, I went to school for 20 years and how to do, learn how to do research. And now you're telling me people from the street are gonna teach me how to do research. And this is where we are, you know? And so a lot of academic, to get academic partners, those who are converted, they are out there. They are with me, they are together. But majority of them, you are right. There is a lot of um, this superiority complex or I don't know, unknown ignorance, or I don't know what to call. Um, to be polite, but uh, there's a lot of that. So getting partnership with the academic partner is difficult. And a lot of people even now might think in my own institution that I don't do research. And uh, it's very, very tough because I tell you what, whatever I do, you know, at the bridge and engagement and in person, it's a very rigorous work. It's very time consuming work. It's labor intensive work. However, it is very, very rewarding. And I tell all my colleagues, you know, your reward is you do the research, you collect the data, you analyze the data, and you publish the paper, and that's your reward. For me, I am at the bridge, and I see Ted there, or Susie there, or somebody there, and that's my reward. Because when people are at the bridge, they are not here, 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 and they're not doing this, 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 right? So mm. my reward is every day. That's what I tell people. And it is it is really rewarding. So Smita, Caroline actually clarifying the question. 
how do you deal with people within the health center? So I guess within the hospital who don't believe tobacco is a high priority issue. Like you know, you and I have talked about even the respirology residents yes. don't necessarily see it. So how? So that's the question. I think how do you think, yeah. how are you approaching it? That's a bigger beast, you know, and I keep doing, I, I recently had a, a very interesting conversation with my oncologist and they were sending me a patient urgent consult because they thought there was a pneumonitis going on because of the fancy, some, some cancer. Third generation, fourth generation treatment they gave and I asked simple question. Do they smoke? And the answer was yes. And I like couldn't keep it together. I said, this is what first we need to attack and before we call upon anything else. And then she took it for heart and then she said, okay, you're right, you're correct. And she invited me to give a session for them and I presented the tobacco dependence guidelines. But you are right, tobacco is a normalized, tobacco is shoved under the rug, tobacco is not taught in medical schools, medical schools are taught disease related, disease focus, and uh, and the medical students and um, residents and fellows, they learn for exams. They only study what's on their exam. So we need to, we need to struggle hard and put tobacco questions on all the exams. Medical student to the fellowship and on all fellowship, not just respirology, not just cardiology, but oncology, hematology. But what about what about I guess administrators and others who also don't see it as a bad, you know, that's not their job, or the psychiatry department that doesn't see it and or mental health. So that I guess is where you know, I know the clients are seeing it's an issue and have bought into it, but it's sometimes a problem with our colleagues. Not so you talk, talked about oncology. Have you had experience with psychiatry and mental health and as well? Similar, exactly similar story, Peter. What can I say? You know, and especially you know in psychiatry, most of the majority of the population tobacco dependence, right? We know that that goes hand in hand, the co addictions mm -hmm. and mental health issues. So it is it is a very tough nut to crack. But you know. I try all these ways, but I think we need to get to the students and we need to get to the exams. Yeah. Because Let me ask you a question. Which is a psychology. Yeah, follow up to that is do you think we should have we should be doing spirometry? You know, I was trying to get spirometry in CAMH so that we could screen every patient here, but the ministry wouldn't let us. So. Uh, that is a basic. That that is basic. I think you need to. You saw our data. We just published yeah, I know. long ago. And we need to screen because the tobacco dependence in the people who have mental health issue is much more severe than mm -hmm. those who do not have mental health issues. We know that, right? They are more addicted, they're severe addiction, they use more. So automatically obstructive lung disease is very high prevalence. So okay. the simple screening with spirometry has to be there. I hope you bring, uh, I, I, I'm I surprised that KMH doesn't have spirometry. Well, it's just the ministry won't allow it to be here. We have to send them out. So it's a it's an interesting thing. We've been trying for a few years. So we'll see if we can make any headway. But you know, there's another great question here, which is Catherine Dickey asked this question: How do you ensure regular follow up sessions if clients have no fixed address or maybe difficult to track and follow up, uh, as well as those in shelters? And I don't know what your experience was during COVID. So if you can just speak to that a little bit, I think it would be very helpful to the audience. That's a very good question, Catherine. And this is how the partnership with people on the ground with lived experience comes in handy. You know, uh, when we have people as partners looking like them, talking like them, uh, with lifestyles and everything, um, hang out around with them, they are the community peer researchers. And those are the people we train on the program and the protocol and research and privacy and etc. But they are the ones who are engaging with the participants. They are the one who know where they hang out. Yes, they do not have fixed address, but they know so and so person. I go this time in the doggy park and I always meet them. So and so person, I go here and I always so they knew where they hang out, what are the com and they would contact them there and bring them with them. You know, so that kind of a partnership with people with lived and living experience is the centerpiece here. And that partnership is what I am talking about, very time consuming and re resource intensive, you know, because they are the same people who face the same day to day challenges with housing and 
uh, food insecurity and legal and police, etc. So that's where the work is to create that partnership. So, uh, yeah, so that's great. And I think, you know, Daryl had that question, um, which I think you answered in just in your presentation was that interested to learn about how the bridge research program engages peer representation from the groups they work with to enhance trust. Communication and design of the services they provide to support individuals. And I think you gave us lots of examples of how you do it and the, and the outcomes are. Really, you know, uh, speak for themselves in that sense, right? But you want to add to that? I mean, you. Yeah, so those kind of, you know, we created like the bridge is like, it's, it's like their family, you know, they pe people say, actually, this is like their home. This is their, uh, you know, so people, it's a casual, nobody has to make appointment. And this is, I'm telling you pre COVID, right? And I'll talk to you about COVID a little bit. Nobody has to make an appointment. They just come, they just say, if somebody wants to talk to somebody, they talk, if they want to just sit in the corner and draw or write or whatever they want to do, or just have a coffee, that's okay. Nobody's judging you. Nobody's looking at you funny. Um, there is food always, some snacks. Uh, food always brings together. We have lots of parties. We cook a lot of turkey dinners and otherwise also dinners and lunches. And that is pre-COVID, right? During the COVID, we had to navigate a lot. We have to make sure that people are safe and we are following all the public health guidelines. And we knew these were the pre COVID statistics, the food insecurity, the housing insecurity. And we knew this was the population which was going to be affected worse. Hands down, so we turned around switch gears and wrote a lot of grants right in the 1st few weeks. We wrote 12 grants and we got 4 of them and we got to work. We got to work to learn the impact of COVID on this population that we engage at the bridge. And we just completed that study. We enrolled 400 people, 400 in-depth interviews, 30 uh, semi-structured interviews, and we are uh, analyzing that data the, to learn the impact of COVID on this population, about the job, the income, just their survival, you know? So during COVID, what did we do? We navigated everything. We did meetings under the tree. We got uh, um, separately packed lunches. Um, if when the, when the parks became available and we did these meetings of the peers and and designed the survey and designed the methods of recruitment uh, online on in person on phone we created a lot of different ways how we get these interviews done and, and, with the people etc and how so that's amazing to speak that how did you adapt the smoking cessation part or did that stop so, so that had to stop because our RCT, as you know, the randomized control trial, the healthy people initiative was in the middle of it. Right? And our RCT is coming and cooking and weekly workshops and just dropping in and by and by talking to Joanne. We had to stop the randomized control trial because we had to close the bridge in the beginning when the pandemic got announced in March 2020, everything was just told to stop, right? Close. Mm -hmm. So the few weeks bridge was literally closed during those uh, the few months till the summer. During those months, we still kept, kept in touch with our peers. We had to stop the study, but we kept uh, in touch with the close peers who were working on the study every yeah. two weeks I would go or every week I would go drive around and give them an envelope. They were doing some questionnaire. They were keeping in contact with the participants of the uh, HPI and we still kept paying them through the honor area, even though the bridge was closed. Mm -hmm. And then um, when the bridge opened, we opened only partially, the kitchen was closed, um, gatherings were not allowed. So we could not do HPI, but HPI is like meeting and greeting and weekly workshops and talking. We could mm. not do that, you know? Mm. So we have still not resumed that. Mm. So I know it is difficult. And, and any any thoughts about how we can adapt for your patient population? I know you had CMHA coming out with the nurse practitioner to give. Nicotine replacement is that? How did that yeah, adapt? CMHA partnership and CMHA nurse comes to uh, the bridge twice a week, and and this was our routine. So now going forward, we are just adopting and reinventing again. And even with the masking and distancing, we have started slowly some small small projects, but not our RCT. But we hope to start that soon with like smaller groups, mm -hmm. still keeping the distancing and masking. 
Yeah. Well, I, I just, I mean, I think, you know, it, it, this is a challenge to everybody and I want to make sure that people have a chance to ask more questions. If you want to post in the chat, uh, or are they in the Q and a, uh, there is a question around the longevity of the NRT, and that's a very good question. And I tell you from clinical experience as well, because I'm a lung doctor and I treat a lot of this, there should be longer treatment. And you know, this um, frozen accident, I borrow that phrase from my brother, but of the uh, duration of treatment of uh, verniclin, duration of treatment of NRT, they are, they should be you know, busted, you know, that should not be there. You do not do that for a hypertensive. You do not do that for a diabetic. And why the hell we do that with such a so severe disease, which is so severe to treat mm -hmm. for like three months, you know? So that should be always objective. Because in clinically, I have so many patients who are taking Champex for long and they are chewing gum for like four years. Yeah. The nicotine gum, you know? Because it's such a lifelong disease. That's right. So, you know what? Let me make sure, Natalie, I know we are getting close to the end. So, I want to make sure we give you enough time. But, you know, on behalf of all of us, thank you so much, Smita, for taking time on your busy schedule. Sorry about the, uh, the difficulty connecting. And But uh, I, I was the opening act and I, I certainly didn't do a good job, but I did as much as I could. So, I'm glad you were able to join. Yeah. Uh, and I, I want to thank all our audience for, for bearing with us and hopefully we didn't lose too many people. Um, but anyway, let me hand it over to you, Natalie. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Selby. I want to reiterate all of that. Thank you, uh, Dr. Fakel. I know our time was a little cut short, but um, you did a great job. And I know I learned a lot and it seems like our audience members did as well. Um, so just before we head off, I want to just go through some final reminders. Um, so uh, I want to remind everyone that this webinar has been recorded and I will be distributing a link to the uh, recording as well as a, a copy of the slides to you all this afternoon. Uh, please feel free to share this with your colleagues. Along uh, with this, I will also be sending a link to the evaluation and post-learning assessment that must be completed by next Wednesday in order to receive your letter of completion. As well, we just want to take the time to uh, let you know about our next uh, webinar coming up on January 12th. Uh, that will be on the topic of smoking and dementia, actually with uh, Dr. Selby that you heard from today and Dr. Raji. Um, and if you missed a portion of today's webinar, would like to view it again or see a previous uh, TEACH webinar, um, as uh, Dr. Selby mentioned earlier, um, an archive list can be found on our website. And uh, for now, thank you all so much for listening and for your patience today. Um, we hope you all have an amazing rest of your day and happy uh, hol holidays to everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so very much. Thank you.